Okay. I actually did encourage Barbara to take as much time as needed. I've actually never met Barbara Chapman. Uh, much admired, uh, I'm an admirer of her book. Happy to hear her speak uh, this time around. So we'll do the Blitz version of Intel threading building blocks. There's a bit of a family tree. There will be some overlap with last year's. I've tried to make it different. Uh, but just to acknowledge some of the family tree here, this is a timeline coming down roughly to the present where we have uh, threading building blocks version three. It owes a lot to uh, two things in particular I'll call out here. The silk scheduler uh, is uh, very happily uh, copied, emulated, let's say, in, uh, in the scheduler of threading building blocks. It's an unfair scheduler. It's a clever idea. The other thing that Intel, te uh, the threading building blocks addresses is a template library. So this, one of the authors actually of the standard template library, Arch Robeson, is the primary architect of TBB. So we get to do a, a concurrent version of STL essentially. I'd also like to point out, since last year in particular, there's been a, a very good collaboration with Microsoft on uh, making the libraries compatible with their PPL and in particular on Windows systems, even though this is, TBB is an open source uh, entity, open source uh, project, uh, underneath uh, it runs on the concurrency runtime. And this is, addresses an issue of uh, composability among different threading models. Uh, it's, it's very important and it's, it's a great development. I would encourage people to take a look at 2009's uh, video archive of this boot camp. There, we, there was a talk by Heidi Pan addressing the problems and the solution approach to composability. Putting everything on the common basis con concurrency runtime uh, goes a long way to addressing that in Windows platforms. So what is TBB? It's a template library. Uh, it's really for C++ programmers. A simple analog is that as OpenMP is to C, uh, this uh, collection, this library is to C++. It definitely uh, is a high level abstraction, We're working at templates and generics. I'm gonna focus on two of the generics here in this uh, abbreviated talk. And it really shifts to the task level and not the threads. The limitations are here noted, uh, the IO bound and in particular the real time is not well supported because, in part because of the unfair scheduler. Uh, a general limitation, it is very biased in favor of a C++ way of doing things. It is not for distributed memory. And it is not, uh, the barrier to entry is a bit higher than is that for OpenMP. A plug for the online. Uh, this is, as I said, an open source project, so you can download versions of the source. There have been some very interesting ports, uh, including to game consoles of this. It's. Uh, has not been limited to uh, x86 processors, as it turns out. This is it. This is sort of a, a cartoon description of what's inside threading building blocks. These are descriptive. I'll have the list in a second. And as I mentioned, I'll focus primarily here on the generics and just mention, some, and, and the scheduler, mention some of the advantages of the scheduler. There are synchronization primitives. You can, in fact, get at the underlying threads through a wrapper. This is not recommended. Uh, and, and the scalable memory allocator is worth mentioning as well because uh, your, our favorites, Malik and Nu, uh, will get you into trouble uh, in terms of scalability and performance issues. You'd really rather have a concurrency-aware allocator as this is. So here is the list, and I believe this is complete as of uh, check this morning. So generic algorithms, we have four and reduce. I'll focus on these two so we can contrast this with the, the OpenMP version of this. And other versions of, of um, generics, the, the items in bold here are new in version three. For those who have done this, you can see over here particularly the unordered map. This was a request by the user community. Could we please line it up a little better with, the, uh, with STL? And this is a, an effort in that direction. So for uh, unordered hash tables, essentially, it would work it this way. It's a task-based 
philosophy. So it really, the mapping of tasks to threads is done in the background. Developers are encouraged to not know uh, the underlying details of the thread. So in contrast to those OpenMP calls we saw of get num or how, you know, how many threads are there and which am I, there are no equivalent commands in TBB by design. So generic programming comes mainly to us through the standard template library. And let's jump ahead with a reminder. The generics, I always have to remind myself, I come from the old school uh, C. But generics just simply mean that you can have a, an operator which is uh, equally at home operating on a range of data types. So as indicated here in this example, ints, doubles, strings, uh, these would be defined somewhere else in my class and operated on by this generic. So here is the list. It's a pretty small library. It's possible for an individual developer to comprehend this, to have it all in your head. Uh, these are all of the generic uh, commands in there. And as I said, I'll concentrate here in examples in 15 minutes on parallel four and parallel reduce. So the parallel four is just definition. Uh, it requires you specify a range and a body. And I'm going absurdly fast here. The body is generic, as shown here. We're going to have a copy constructor and a destructor and then the body of this generic will be applied to a certain range or a subrange. Uh, the range is indicated here. I think best we go, given the limited time, to an example. So here's a parallel four, the simplest possible case. We're going to do some, we're going to start with a for loop. We're going to range over this and do some silly example here. We're just going to uh, accumulate values here into an array. And we'll call this change array from a main. So here's the sequential code. And typically these days and for the foreseeable future, we're frequently starting with sequential code. So the first thing you need to do is uh, objectify it, as I've sometimes heard. So here is how that would be transformed. We'll first transform the main. So here's some boilerplate. We have to have certain includes. These just come with the, uh, with the package. Namespace is certainly a convenience to use, uh, as is in other classes in C++. And you always want to initialize the scheduler. And that's it in terms of changes to the main. Notice, however, here, this isn't change array anymore. This is a different, uh, it's a different object. So here is the definition. Let me go back one here. So this is the original sequential change array. Here it is objectified, so to speak. So we have data and the corresponding operator with it. So a C programmer will look at this and say, you've got to be kidding me. You know, why do I have to do this much uh, extra work? You know, where's, the, where, where's my stuff? It's just right here. And you've added all this extra boilerplate. But the starting point is anticipated to be he, this, this box rather than the simple uh, procedural line here with the for loop. So in that case, if you're already here, then it's a much more straightforward uh, transformation. So I haven't included, notice I've done two screens, I haven't included the main. So we're defining the task. Here's the algorithm or the operator that's being used. And here I've called out explicitly an auto partitioner. And this will relate to the scheduler I'm talking about. So what's happening in this parallel four? There's a range over which it operates. This is the complete range. We're calling change array body here, but inside that, notice there are begins and ends. So here's where the scheduler is going to take care of uh, partitioning this out. It's a bit more explicit than in OpenMP, but you don't have to define the begins and ends. You just make it accessible. And in particular, you can let the auto partitioner take care of it. So how would this work in a big, long code? Here is something that resembles our change array. It's foo in this case. But we call from main a change array parallel, which is defined here with its operation. Any questions at this point? I've never done this at such a pace. 
What I'd like to do, the reason for these two slides, here is sort of an end result of taking, uh, recasting uh, the operation in terms that can be, uh, where you can use TBB. There's recently been much better support of lambda functions in compilers overall. So compared again to last year, uh, you can almost uh, assume lambda function support in compilers. And this is what the same code looks like if done lambda function style, you notice this bracket uh, here. Let's see if I can point to it. Bracket equals is essentially letting the compiler do the work for you. So all of that re range, rearranging with boilerplate, uh, putting the operator inside the object and so forth is now done pretty much automatically here uh, with this lambda function invocation. I really like this approach because it looks a lot more like the serial code. Yes, question there. Down to the boost. So I'll repeat the question for the for the uh, for the video. So the question is, why don't we use even more C++, for example, boost, and uh, take advantage, so reduce the boilerplate requirements in that way. And I'll take that back to the developers. It's, that's a good question. Uh, let me table that. We'll post that. Actually, I'll, I'll commit to, on video here. I'll commit to uh, having one of the developers respond to that on the forum. Here's another example. This is from an actual code, an actual toy code of Game of Life. Once again, we're starting with the sequential code. We introduce some boilerplate in yellow, sort of the required pieces you would automatically do. Library headers, namespace, always initialize the scheduler. And then we have to define the class and the operator. So this would be a standard process to take it from a, a, a C-like code into a C++-like code. At that point, uh, again, it's possible to invoke lambdas and have it look cleaner. So this would be the lambdified version of this plus the previous page. It's a lot more compressed. So in this case, we're capturing it by reference as opposed to the equal sign. We haven't specified the auto partitioner argument because that is the default. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the task scheduler because this turns out to be a, a big advantage of doing this. Here are some of the problems faced in scheduling over subscription. Actually, that came out a little bit. Someone asked the question, can we define more threads than we have resources for? And this you know, results in an oversubscribed situation. Fair scheduling is how operating systems typically do it, and that is not the way uh, thread building blocks does it. Uh, overhead for tasks and load imbalances, all of these are these problems are intended to be addressed uh, here. Let's speak a little bit about uh, a choice of how you might partition tasks on the, so I'll use the mouse pointer, on the left side. You'd want to go depth first and you get really good locality, really good data locality. If that hasn't been addressed already, I know that people will talk about PGAS languages and so on. Data, data locality is a great advantage on cache-based systems. But here we don't get much parallelism. Over here, if you go breadth first and go across, you get essentially no cache locality, but nice parallelism. So the, the way to do this is compromise and work depth first, but steal work, the other tasks steal work, breadth first. So one, one particular task can dive and the other steal from the largest available amount of work. Here's a cartoon that marches through that. So when this happens in the parallel four in the blocked range, this is exactly how the scheduler would treat it. We'd start off and split. The first thread available comes and splits and, and pushes the other work into a pool and forgets about it. This work over here is available to be stolen by other threads. This happens again, likewise. A thread may come along and take that and split it and leave the rest to be stolen by other threads. 
Finally, a level of granularity is hit where it says, no, I'm just going to finish the work. We're not going to split this any further. The advantage of this is that all the threads tend to be busy. And because we're diving you know, down in each case, you get at least some data locality. Here's an example, a sort of a quick sort example. So to, or what you can't read there across the top are uh, a random uh, assortment of 0 through 64 digits that are going to be sorted in numeric order. So what will happen is thread 1 starts with it, creates a pivot, takes its half over here, and forgets the rest. So in this case, the, the quick sort algorithm itself is essentially mapping to the way the scheduler works. The next thread is going to come along. Thread two, it gets the work that's left over. And each one of these threads, in turn, will partition the work, leaving a large body for other threads to pick up. Along come the other threads. Take the large body that's been set aside by threads one and two and in turn partition the work. Finally, someone's going to start doing some actual work when we hit a granularity where it makes sense to do so. And we're seeing that in the cartoon here. And done. So quicksort is a nice intuitive way to understand the scheduler because uh, the way it works algorithmically uh, maps very, very neatly to the scheduler. Here's parallel reduce. Between parallel four and parallel reduce, I'm going to be able to show the same pi example we saw in the previous talk. The parallel reduce takes, takes four arguments in all. The same, uh, actually, a splitting constructor, because we're going to reduce things. Destructor, which they will all need, and accumulate and, and merge, as you would expect from a reduction. And here's the same uh, diagram. Uh, Barbara sent me her slides ahead of time, so I said, oh, I'm going to do the same one here. So here's the code, skipping the math, since you've just seen that. This is the code which will turn, uh, you know, just sum up over the area of all these rectangles and give you the value of pi. Now, in the case of TVB, we're not going to do this with a parallel 4. Earlier saw a parallel 4, OMP parallel 4, oh yeah, and we can tack on a reduction. In this case, the reduce uh, takes care of everything for you. So let's see, we've got the same boilerplate as before. And we're going to have to define, we'll see this on the next page, what my pi is. We're going to parallel reduce. Here's the reduce. And we have how many arguments? I said four, one, two, three. If a fourth one is omitted, it's just taking the default. In fact, we could have left off the auto partitioner. I'm just given two of these. So we accumulate the results, whoops, and join. Here's the class my pi, which had to be created. So this is where the sequence, the C programmer says, please. Uh, so we created the class MyPy. It has the operation in here. And there is a join. Here's a Lambda version. I just found it on the forum this morning, in fact. So I'm crediting uh, the contributor. This is on the threadingbuildingblocks.org forum. He's dropped that in here. Yeah, the, the Russians are very big on uh, threading building blocks. <laughs> Uh, and here we have, he's used all four of the arguments in this case in order to get a lambda function. So very nicely, and I've copied his orthography here where he has one argument per line, where the functions now are inlined. And we've also had to inline the join in this case. But here we have it essentially on one screen. I've just, I've stripped off the boilerplate headers at the top. Uh, but otherwise, this is it. This is all the code, which without the lambdas took two screens worth of code. So this, this does work, this code. So this, this may not seem like a big advantage compared to OpenMP. And, and honestly, it's not intended to replace or compete with OpenMP. You want to take the, the approach which stylistically best fits. But there are certain advantages to the scheduler uh, that in some projects will be important. And here's one I don't believe is available in OpenMP. Barbara, I don't know if they're considering this in version 4. But where you're in a, um, if you've done this big uh, distribution of work, 
but the nature of the workload is such that when, uh, say, you're on a search and you found it, you can just stop. We're done. Do we have this in the? They are considering it. It's a good thing to have. Okay, so it's in the good. I imagine over time, they all everything converges to the same uh, same set of tricks. So this is a good one to avoid unneeded work. Analogous to this is if the class, if your work gets canceled or throws an exception for some reason. Again, at that point, you just interrupt the whole business because for better or for worse, you're done on that. So here I have a little bit of a special effects. So the data locality comes implicitly through the way the work is, is, is split, as I showed. You're going to get an awful lot of it by accident. But if you'd like to get it more explicitly, there is the option to specify task to thread affinity. And this was done to advantage in this particular toy game. The, uh, the URL is there. This is, again, open source. Some Intel engineers cooked this essentially to show off uh, different techniques for parallel. And to wake us up, I will run it. So this is a standard uh, first-person shooter game. It has only three elements. It's intentionally simple. You have the physics. I can turn some sound on, I suppose. There we go. The physics is taking care of the collisions and also the falling blocks. There is also uh, particles, which is taking care of the smoke. Well, that's not very bright, is it? So the smoke, and when the blocks fall, if we could see that, there's some dust that gets, there we go, as the cannonball over there. Some dust is thrown up by the falling blocks. So the dust and the cannonball smoke is covered by the particles uh, piece. And finally, there's an AI piece, which is controlling the behavior of some bugs, which are, you see running around here. And the AI behavior of the bugs is they're hurting, and they're trying to get out of the way if we chase them, as you see. <laughs> so there's three components to this game and different levels of workload. It's entirely open source. This one is done with the ODE uh, physics engine. Uh, there are other versions with Newton and Havoc. So it's, it, people have played with this one. I have to say, it's, it's fun to show this in the U.S. We showed this example a couple of years ago in, in Europe, in Central Europe, where castles are not just uh, something out of Disneyland, and they were, they were mightily offended, so we won't show this one in Europe anymore. Uh, so, but here we go. So how would we approach this in parallel? On a simple task-based approach to this, you would say, okay, we'll do the physics. We'll do, put the rendering off somewhere. That's a separate task. That's kind of a no-brainer. And then we'll feed that rendering engine you know, with our physics, our, our, our particles, and our AI. But if you just assigned physics to one task, obviously you're not going to scale greater than the number of tasks we have listed there. So what you want to do is, is definitely divide the task, but subdivide uh, as possible. Now I'm going to cut back. Sorry, I finished the game here. So that's sort of uh, I've anticipated the wording on this slide. So a number of threads hardwired into the code. That was a tradition, I suppose, at the time this was cooked a couple years ago for a game developer conference. You'd rather do this differently. So it's now possible uh, to do to that auto partitioner to instead use an affinity partitioner. And that turned out to be very useful in this game. And a uh, little cartoon here. This is, would be an eight thread version. So think of this as marching to the right time wise with a, a tick of rendering uh, at a fixed interval. And you know, each thread's picking up what it has. This is that work stealing business. So you know, if, if the scheduler just grabs the next big thing that's in the pool, you end up with something that looks a bit like this where the particular threads or cores, or more importantly, the caches, are jumping around and reloading. With thread affinity, it actually 
and it gives you something more like this so that you get a, a good deal of data locality. And this turned out to give a, a significant measurable improvement uh, to the performance. I have a little movie of the two, but we can, we can take my word for it. All of this is downloadable. As I said, sources, movies, comments, uh, the whole bit. So this may be a good time to stop, although I'll mention scalable memory allocators. As I said at the top, these are important um, because you would find malloc, sorry, new, uh, would be uh, is typically a locking uh, operation. So one thread wants it, the other threads wait. If you use a scalable one, you're not; they won't get it in one another's way. It's possible, in fact, to just reset your defaults on the compiler to use the TBB uh, version in your code. Let me skip to the last slide, so I know I'm standing between people and coffee. Uh, <laughs> and break, and especially the afternoon uh, doze. So how do I know how many threads are available in TBB? I've already given the answer. The answer is don't ask, you can't know. So not even the scheduler knows. And this is by design. It's to force the development in directions that move away from worrying about low level threads. So I'm gonna stop, and thank you. Oh, a question. Oh, I'm not getting out of here easy. <laughs> Two comments. First uh -huh. of all, there are people in Europe of about my age who remember when their castles, homes, and churches were brought down about 30 or 65 years ago. That may uh, explain one thing. The other is that when you uh, have spawned a large number of threads mm -hmm. and you said an exception of some sort occurs, then you abandon the whole thing. That's a mistake. Uh -huh. The reason is that they may be searching for something. And all that an exception means, perhaps, is that this particular thread looked somewhere where what you want is not to be found. And therefore, you just ignore it and let the other threads complete. So uh, you may want to be a bit more flexible about this policy. I'm writing that down, and I want to make sure I capture the other question, too. I don't want to s that's, that's an excellent point. And just to make sure I've not misrepresented what in fact happens, I'll check on that. And in both cases, so there's that, and why don't we use Boost and, and even more C++? This is a sort of philosophical. Well, I, I think, I mean, you know, using Lambda is, is exactly the right thing. Like Mike said, you don't need to be in C++ about that. Ah. Okay. I'll see if I can get Arch Robeson to comment on that. He's right in the middle of this. And the point about exceptions, exception handling. For example, an invalid arithmetic operation generating a man mm -hmm. is sometimes a disaster, and sometimes it just says, well, you shouldn't have looked there. Mm. Okay. Actually, it's a setting. You have a point, though. It's, it's not something that happens automatically. I, I glossed through everything in the slides, but it's a particular uh, choice that you, you feed to the scheduler to say, you know, do this uh, given an exception or given that you're done on your search. And I think your point is that it, it would be a mistake for the most part on the developer's part to uh, do that too blindly, I guess. But that's, that's worth a really good discussion. And I'm going to try to take that. Thank you. Yes. You know, the, who is using TBB is the question, and I should have been repeating the questions uh, for the video. Uh, probably the most um, notable uh, in commercial products is Adobe in the Creative Suite. Uh, as of the release of CS5, they've incorporated TBB in, into their product. There are some other sort of markety slides that show a, a big list with lots of company logos, but that's the one that comes to mind. That's a fair number. It's a, it's a respectable number of commercial accounts that are doing it on, on the level of Adobe. Yes? Yeah, related question to that. Have, have there been any efforts to compare OpenMP and TBB for real HPC applications? So the question uh, for the video is, have there been efforts to compare 
OpenMP and TBB for HPC, in particular, HPC applications. People are always benchmarking it, and you will find a lot of this on, on various software forums, particularly Software Intelcom has a, has a couple of threads about this. And there will be advantages as sort of, I would say the gold standard for heavily data parallel programming where you have a static amount of stuff like the Pi example, the gold standard there tends to be OpenMP. You'll get the really as good a performance as you're going to get. TBB will show up in advantageously in situations where that scheduler is, is very important. And, and you know the task stealing comes into play. But uh, yeah, every now and then some of the engineers at Intel get into a bit of a rivalry. They say, mine's better than yours sort of thing. And what typically happens is they end up at about the same place. So I, I'm not sure. I think it's more you want to do it, not so much one is going to be better performance, is that which one is better for a certain type or class of workloads. It's why we maintain both of them. Yes. So, so the question is, what, what is the overhead if these uh, constructs are used uh, with w only a single thread, for example, used sequentially? And I don't know the answer offhand. I'm more familiar actually with the OpenMP, which was sort of, sort of my home territory. I was on the original uh, scheduler, uh, sorry, the uh, specification. And there the overhead is quite small. I don't know the answer. I'm going to write that down. Uh, what is overhead if using TBB constructs serially? The Especially the allocator. Okay. Where's the best place for me to park these answers? I've got three now promised back to you. And after this session, I'm going to shoot emails to the right people. We can certainly post them on the uh, Threading Building Blocks um, uh, forum. So I'll encourage you to find it. The answers will be there. Okay, I think we're set. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.